the ladies maybe. Mm. We, uh, well, of course, you can't wear a super collecting ring or anything. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so here, uh, here I want to say some sociological remarks here. So this previous um, uh, graph tells you, so you can ask the question, how did anybody discover this? How did, how did they really figure out? How, how did they really come to find this material? It looks so complicated. I mean, there are 100 elements in the periodic table. 10 to the power of 5, which is you know, the number of combinations that you can put, is, is incredible. How does anybody figure out how a material is superconducting? So this is how it works. So it's not just for superconductivity. It's for any, if you want a new type of semiconductor, you want a new type of a solar cell, you want a new type of a, a material that uh, is uh, resistance to corrosion, Whatever you are interested in, in, in terms of creating new materials, and that happens all the time in different parts of the world. And the, the basic, there are a bunch of people called chemists, and they their only interest is to make new stuff. But they get thrilled when they make something that didn't exist before. That's their life. And, and they make hundreds per year, and they publish it. They publish, some of them publish the structure of this material. They do what are called X-ray diffraction, and they figure out where the atoms are in, in, in the new material that they make. And then people like me, they, they spoon through these, and then we pick what looks promising out of these hundreds per year that come out, one or two or maybe ten uh, materials will be selected, and their properties will be studied in further detail for whatever specific uh, purpose we are interested in. And then, out of this 10 or so, one or two, there will be physicists who will ask very deep questions, and they will, they, they are not interested in any materials, they want perfect single crystals of these materials, and then they study uh, further uh, uh, experiments on that. And eventually, out of this, some will move forward, uh, and, and get into R and D, you know, somebody will discover, oh, this material has this particular property. Uh, I'm going to exploit it. I'm going to make a company out of it or whatever. And then some of the R and D, they will fail. They will not be successful. And uh, one or two will reach the market and have an impact. So that's how it works. It's a pyramid. Sales is not not selling. This idea came from a scientist called Brian Sales. So we call it as a sales pyramid. So, I have, uh, I started at 12, I have, uh, what time, 11, I started at 11, uh, so I have 20 minutes, so everybody is doing okay, I'm not putting you to sleep, okay. um, so, um, so that's how it works, so um, uh, we have, um, what are these, these, I refer to these very highest uh, uh, transition temperature superconductors and uh, they were discovered again accidentally uh, by Bernard and Miller, two German uh, scientists who uh, had a very good idea um, and what they discovered is still being uh, debated in terms of its understanding. Uh, I put this up, I don't want to explain to you everything, I, I just want you to realize how complicated it is so that's why I put it up. Um, uh, so, uh, compared to copper or niobium, which is one of the good superconductors, 9 degrees Kelvin is the transition temperature, it's a simple metal. So, all you have is a cubic <coughs> arrangement of niobium atoms in that solid. Compared to that, this looks like a you know, very complicated solid. Uh, the, the atoms are even there. And uh, uh, this is also an oxide. So, oxide, silicon oxide, lead oxide, you know. You know the oxides that you come across in nature around you, uh, they are not metals, they are all insulators. Uh, and this belongs to that same kind of family. And in fact, the people uh, who got the Nobel Prize, the kind of synthetic techniques that they used to make this material uh, was is used in the ceramic industry. So, it's, so ceramics are not conductors by any stretch of the imagination. So, uh, so, uh, how did something that is not even a metal uh, become a superconductor? <coughs> so, this is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have today. We don't have a complete theoretical understanding of what is going on. So, so this is a challenge to that uh, theory that I uh, talked to you about, the BCS theory. Um, a lot of 
people believe that uh, VCSTD cannot explain the occurrence of superconductivity in these high temperature superconductors. Um, and uh, in India particularly, there is uh, a lot of work uh, current here at the Nature of Science and in other places. Uh, there are strong groups uh, working on the theoretical aspects and um, there's some very nice work recently that I heard about uh, which, which, may, uh, which may solve this problem and if it did solve the problem, that person will win the Nobel Prize for sure. So, uh, so it's again a very interesting field. That um, um, so what else can we say? So here we have temperature and this is the field. Uh, I didn't explain to you earlier, but uh, if you uh, go back to and remember that picture of uh, Camel in Honest, uh, the, uh, how the resistance came down with temperature, uh, if you remember that, uh, if you apply a magnetic field, uh, I can destroy superconductivity. So, uh, magnetic fields uh, are, are not good for superconductors. So, here I have a picture. Uh, for the high temperature, the, the one that I showed you, the crystal structure, the atrium rain copper oxide, uh, its uh, transition temperature is 90 degrees Kelvin. And uh, if you, uh, you need um, extremely high magnetic field, so anything below this line is superconducting. Anything above this line is a regular map. Okay? So if you, and, and I have many of these materials here. So each material has its own line. So if you take this line, then here, if you have a magnetic field this large and that high a temperature, then it's no longer superconducting. If I am here, even, if, even though I am at high temperature, if I am at low enough magnetic field, the material is superconducting. Uh, uh, why does this line end here? Because we don't have the facilities to make measurements. The highest magnetic fields in the world are of the order of 50 or 60 Tesla because this unit is Tesla. What is Tesla? Tesla is 10 to the 4 Gauss. So the Earth's magnetic field is about half a Gauss. So 10 to the 4 is 10,000 Gauss. So 10,000 times the Earth's magnetic field is 1 Tesla. So 10 Tesla is 100,000 times. So if you go to 100, that's 1 million times as strong as the Earth's field. We don't have magnets that can produce that kind of a magnetic field. So we stop our measurements here. So if you're one of the byproducts of superconductivity research will be if you are able to make good quality wires out of this material, then you can wind magnets out of this material and cool it down to this kind of temperature, let us say 10 Kelvin or even liquid hydrogen temperature, which is 20 Kelvin, then this line will go up, right? So this line will go up to 100, 200, 300, we don't know. So you can make magnets that are 300 Tesla, powerful, okay? So that's one of the, the goals of superconductivity. So I already told you about NGP2, I explained a little bit about copper oxide, the why the ceramic superconductors, why they don't uh, obey the, 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 the uh, BCS uh, theory. And then, uh, more recently, three, four years ago, um, uh, I also told you that magnetic fields are not good for superconductors. So if you apply a magnetic field, you destroy superconductivity. Uh, you don't have to apply a magnetic field. Instead of applying a magnetic field, you can put iron atoms inside the superconductor. So if you take myopium and you put iron in it, iron is magnetic on its own. You know that. So when you put iron atoms inside the superconductor, you don't need an outside magnet to produce the magnetic field because you have iron atoms sitting there which are producing the magnetic field. And that will destroy superconductivity. So that was the conventional wisdom. Uh, uh, but three years ago, all of a sudden in Japan, they found that there are some compounds of iron which become superconductive. So, this is another challenge for this BCS theory, which does not like magnetic fields uh, uh, to be there, uh, uh, to have a superconductor. So, uh, now we are in a new era, new phase uh, uh, of theory, of theoretical understanding, where <coughs> we have now changed our ideas and think that magnetism is necessary to have superconductivity. 
So we have now uh, uh, what we call as phase diagrams. So what are these phase diagrams? That means you have two variables, thermodynamic variables, one temperature, one pressure, and you ask uh, what is the, the, the phases, just like water, liquid, uh, solid, and gas, uh, these materials can have different phases. Uh, so if you have, <coughs> what is this here, uh, you have anti-ferromagnetic, that means the, the uh, ion atoms are lined up, you know, one up, one down. Uh, so if you have anti-ferromagnetic uh, phase, uh, you can also have, uh, so this here is the, the superconducting phase, and then you have here uh, no, no, no magnetism at all, uh, just like a regular mesh, and uh, you have more complicated diagrams. So there are people uh, in uh, Bangalore who are trying to uh, calculate these things, you know, can I predict this line, can I predict that line, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of work in that area. So we've changed our ideas. It is not complete, but it's still evolving, but it's a fascinating uh, story. Uh, another remark that I want to make here is that the leaders in this field of uh, iron-based superconductors are, guess who? The Chinese. Uh, they have a lot of people, they have lots of coordinated teams. I gave you this pyramid, this idea of the pyramid and how you build from the bottom. So um, you have lots of people working at the bottom, who are going after these materials and then they are able to uh, organize their teams and they hold the record for this uh, 53.5 Kelvin, which is not as high as the oxide superconductors, but some of these the iron-based superconductors don't have as many atoms. This one is the wrong one. There are others which have only three atoms in there. They are much easier to process in terms of the kilo signs to make wires and so on. And people have already made wires out of these new ones. It's only three years old, but they have um, already done it. And uh, there's this great uh, future for uh, that field. I think. Okay, so now I'm going to jump on to applications. And uh, before I go to real application, applied applications, I want to uh, just point out that these ideas in superconductivity have impacted other areas of science. Uh, people believe that there are neutron stars which have a super conducting core, that is the inside of the neutrons are just like that. They don't have charge, but they have what is called a spin, uh, which is a magnetic, which is a quantum property, so just like electrons, what you think. Another uh, very uh, recent, you would all read about this, uh, and India is involved in this experiment. Uh, this is the search for the dark particle, so-called dark particle, and uh, superconductivity plays a major role. It's a behind-the-scenes role. Uh, not many people know about it, but how you accelerate these protons that are used to you know, smash against each other, uh, that is done with superconducting magnets. And uh, uh, just for the kick of it, uh, this is the largest scientific instrument ever built. It is also the largest cryogenic facility ever built. So it has 130 tons of liquid helium. So it's amazing. Um, um, that's just the details of the wires. I'm going to skip that. So um, let me spend the next 10 minutes or so, and I'll have enough time for questions later. Um, so this is the uh, applied applications. Uh, so this is already you can because the wires don't have any resistance. You don't have ionic heating, so you don't have loss of energy due to dual heating. And so you can get uh, you can get DC transmission. So all of the uh, long distance transmission nowadays is done with AC. And why is that? Because you want to avoid uh, minimize. You cannot avoid. You minimize the ohmic heating. So uh, you can totally eliminate that if you do <coughs> superconducting transmission. The estimates are it's not great, but um, yeah, estimates are that seven percent of the world's energy consumption can be saved by uh, uh, having superconducting transmission. And uh, there is one fellow who has come up with uh, a concept uh, uh, that is to blanket the entire Sahara uh, with photoelectric cells, which can be done today with today's technology, and then run superconducting wires uh, from Sahara to the rest of the seven continents and uh, uh, thereby 
solve the energy problem completely. Uh, so that uh, there is a proposal like that. Uh, superconducting magnets, uh, this is already happening. <coughs> I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, uh, particle accelerators, I gave you an example. Energy storage has been talked about. Uh, if you do the calculations, uh, if you take the size of a football field, which is about 300 meters uh, in diameter, and wind the coil, which is about 100 feet or so tall, uh, and then, uh, I mean, these are all very uh, futuristic, but uh, uh, it's possible um, that you can store enough energy to uh, supply uh, a population of about 100,000 for, um, uh, for uh, let's assume all other power <coughs> Uh, the amount of energy stored in that, uh, uh, it will last for about two months. Uh, 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 by U.S. standards, uh, by Indian standards, uh, it will last for 20 months or so. So, uh, so you can go for roughly one year uh, without any other power, just by magnetic energy storage. Uh, you can have maglev, I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Uh, there is already a very... Uh, significant application of these uh, oxide superconductors uh, uh, in power conditioning. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I don't know how many of you know the story, in New York City there was a blackout and when they had the blackout in New York City, uh, they had to invite the Indian engineers to come and fix it uh, because in the U.S. they had no experience on dealing with blackouts. Uh, in India, I do it all the time. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, so power conditioning, so that you avoid blackout, uh, is one of the key uh, uh, um, uh, goals, uh, at least in the U.S. Uh, I'm sure it should be here also, and it's already in use. So power conditioning is built out of superconducting uh, um, uh, storage, energy storage devices are already uh, being marketed. Uh, so those are large scale. When I, when I say large scale, uh, I just you can look at it in two ways. One in terms of the dollar amount, uh, another in terms of how big the thing is. Uh, so these are all big things, uh, uh, size of the human being or bigger. Uh, you can also talk about small scale, which is uh, the electronic scale, you know, the micro scale. Um, so uh, there are already. Uh, cell phone companies already use superconducting filters, so uh, because the resistance is uh, low or zero, uh, you can make, and this zero resistance state persists not only in, for DC current, but also for AC current. So at uh, 1 gigahertz or 3 gigahertz or whatever the cell phone spectrum is, uh, that uh, resistance, low resistance is still valid. So those of you who have studied uh, LRC circuits and all, you know, omega L by R, that's the Q factor. So when R goes to zero, your Q factor goes to infinity, and you can make a filter which is extremely sharp. So you can have, you know, numerous conversations separated from each other. How do you do that? Uh, you do it with extremely sharp filters. Uh, so that's one application that's already there. And uh, try to explain a little bit of what the squid is. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, medical imaging is also available. Uh, medical imaging comes in two different ways. Uh, one through superconducting magnets, which is MRI, uh, but another is uh, through these uh, uh, squids, uh, what are called squids. I will try to explain that uh, in a few minutes. So, let me just flash some pictures. Uh, so, this is uh, the Long Island, New York installation in 2005, started in 2005. High temperature superconducting cable going underground. Uh, this distance here is only three feet. Um, I had another picture, I couldn't get it in time. Uh, but all of you can imagine this this whole thing replaced what you see next to highways. I'm sure even here. So next to highways, you have these huge towers, about 50 feet wide. That's the amount of space that they need, or 50 feet or more and it's high voltage and dangerous and all of that, so all of that can be replaced by three feet of ground space under the roof. Of course, you need liquid nitrogen going through these tubes and so on, but that technology can be solved. And then in the U.S., it makes sense to do this in highly populated areas where the cost of real estate is very, very high. So the cost of real estate is high, you can't get space for towers or underground space. Maybe I will to reach the same state in three or five years, I don't know. So it does make sense to think about those kinds of things. Um, here is um, 
Uh, here is GE, of course, is the power company government owned or private? It's all government owned here, right? Power is government owned? Uh, or, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, so GE, uh, this is MRI, they recently came up with an open MRI. So MRI is, uh, uh, I don't have the time to describe it, but basically you do imaging using magnetic resonance. And what is magnetic resonance? Uh, you have uh, the protons in your body, uh, they are also quantum objects, they have what is called a spin and you apply a very strong magnetic field so you line up uh, a fraction of these proton, protons, maybe 10 to the minus 3 or something like that of the protons and then you apply, here is, so that DC field, that the magnetic field used to line up these protons is produced by uh, the magnet that is here. So the coil is inside that. Uh, in this case, I think it, it's circular like this. And there is liquid helium inside. So this whole device is, is cooled and kept cold forever. Uh, and uh, this coil here is an RF coil. So what, is, what does the RF coil do? The RF coil uh, applies a magnetic field in the perpendicular direction and flips these, uh, these protons. And when the RF coil is removed, the protons want to come back to their original state and they don't come back immediately like that. They come back, they process like that and then they slowly come back. And when they are processing, they emit radio waves and these radio waves are picked up by the same coil that, that produced the, the, the RF field in the first place. Uh, and this, this radio waves are processed uh, using computers nowadays, of course, and uh, to image. Uh, and they are spectacular. It's, it's amazing what they can do with, with MRI. Much better than X-rays and so on. So you can get great detailed uh, pictures of uh, uh, the human body. As, as long as you have protons uh, in your in your body, you can image. <laughs> so here is a uh, maglev. Uh, this is uh, Japan railway. Uh, Maglev 2006 or something like that. It is not a commercial operation. <coughs> it's a test facility. There are Maglevs in the world which are commercially uh, uh, use uh, 300, uh, 400 kilometers per hour uh, is, the, is the speed. But those are made out of normal magnets. They are not made out of superconducting <coughs> magnets. They are made out of electromagnets, regular electromagnets. This one is still a test facility. As far as I know, there is no. Uh, uh, operational uh, uh, superconducting system yet. And how does that work? Uh, the superconducting system works uh, like this. Uh, you have, uh, so the, the train carries the, the, the liquid helium. So the train is cool, part of it of course, and uh, the magnets are inside the train, and uh, they adjust the polarity, so the north pole and the south pole. The tracks also have magnets. They, those are permanent magnets on the tracks, and uh, those are not they don't have to be superconducting magnets, they can be permanent magnets. And uh, uh, so the north pole repels the north pole, the south pole attracts the north pole, and so on. So that levitates the train. And then, so you need separate magnets for levitation and separate magnets for propulsion. Um, uh, so, the, so the propulsion works the same way repulsion, attraction, repulsion, attraction, and then you can go square. So, um, so those are some ideas. A squid is a, it's an electronic device. Uh, uh, I told you that superconductors uh, don't like magnetic field, uh, but um, uh, there is a special kind of a device you can build using superconducting wire. It just stand, stands for this acronym, superconducting quantum interference device. And uh, these are X marks here of what are called as joints and junctions. So I did make the remark that Josephson, uh, you can have a Josephson current. So what does that mean? You can have a current without applying any voltage. So if I take a superconducting ring and have a Josephson junction here, and then I don't, I'm not applying any current. I just change the magnetic field inside. And remember, I also told you the superconductor doesn't like the magnetic field, the Meissner effect. It tries to expel the magnetic field. And the way it does that is by creating its own current. So it creates its own current inside this loop. And because you have this junction, uh, that current will give rise to a voltage drop. So between there and there, there will be a voltage drop. If you don't have this junction, there won't be any voltage drop. There will still be a current. 
so this voltage drop can be measured and therefore the squid is, you can think of this as a transducer which takes the magnetic field, it actually takes the magnetic flux, not the magnetic field. What is the flux? The flux is magnetic field times area. So area is constant. When the magnetic field changes, the flux changes and the change in flux will give rise to a change in current and because there is a junction here, the change in current will give rise to a change in voltage. So, so it's a transducer which goes from magnetic field to voltage. So it's a transducer. So what can you do with a transducer? So a lot of people work with sensors. So uh, here is, uh, you can image prime waves. Uh, what kind of a magnetic field change can you measure? You can measure femtotesla. What is femtotesla? 10 to the minus 15 tesla. So that's about 10 to the minus 11 times smaller than the Earth's magnetic field. So obviously if you want to do these measurements, you have to shut out the Earth's magnetic field completely as far as possible, so you need special rooms with magnetic shielding and so on. But you know, all of that is doable and here is one picture, here's a person. Uh, this is a, a cap, a skull cap made with these squid sensors and you can image brain waves. So here is one example. That vertical bar there is 100 femtotesla. So this, they've done measurements of uh, epilepsy. Uh, you do also, uh, you, you put, you stimulate parts of the brain with uh, uh, wires like this, different parts, you can send signals to different parts. And the sensors are here, they're, they're cryogenic, they're cool. And then you process the data and so on. So it's not very widespread, uh, but uh, it has been done. Uh, and of course it meets the technology. Uh, you can also get signals from the heart. Uh, of what your doctor does is EEG, it's electrocardiography. Um, uh, uh, whereas this is magnetocardiography. What he measures actually is current. Anytime you have a current, you have magnetic field around the current, you all know that. And that's what you sense with these sensors. And these signals are about a hundred times a thousand times stronger than the brain signal. So this is your systolic, diastolic. Uh, so they have characteristic signature. And I'll give an example here. It's a normal heart and they have normal heart. So you can also do this again. It's not widespread, but it's possible. Um, squids can also be used uh, in, as building <coughs> blocks of superconducting circuits. Um, IBM had a program to build a superconducting computer. They gave away the program or stopped it because they did, wasn't going anywhere according to the management. Uh, but that, that program goal was to build a conventional <coughs> computer. So a conventional computer, as you all know, has works with bits. It's all digital, right? So you have zero and one. So you can think of uh, uh, the current through the squid. The current through the squid going one way could be zero, current through the squid going the other way could be one. So, uh, uh, so you have a conventional computer, uh, but that program has been stopped. Uh, but there's a lot of interest in the U.S. in building a quantum computer. Uh, what is a quantum computer? So in a conventional computer you have ones and zeros as the building blocks, but uh, I, I didn't explain it to you again, it requires a little bit of explanation, but in quantum physics you can have uh, what is called a superposition of states. In other words, if you imagine, uh, if you imagine in, a, in a regular computer you have <coughs> end gates and non gates and all these kinds of things, you can take gates and hand them them and, and process your signals. And, the inputs to all the gates are ones and zeros, and the outputs of all the gates are also ones and zeros. So, so they are discrete. So once you fix the set of ones and zeros in the input, the set of ones and zeros on the outputs are fixed. So that's how you do your computation with gates. Um, in quantum uh, computer, uh, you have not only one and zero, you can have in between. And, and the in-between can be anything. So this, 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 this is due to a special <coughs> property of uh, uh, quantum objects, uh, which is called a superposition. And, uh, and so if you build a computer with a quantum bit, which is called a qubit, 
then the inputs are not confined to ones and zeros, and the outputs also are not confined to ones and zeros. So, so the outputs will depend upon what are called as probabilities. Okay. So, in other words, imagine you can do parallel processing. So, so. In a regular digital computer, you have ones and zeros, you have discrete set of ones and zeros, and you get one answer on the outside. If you want to change the input variables, you can do that, but it's a separate operation to change the input variables, and then, of course, you get uh, the output is different. But in a quantum com computer, you can simultaneously put in all the input variables and get all the output variables. So it's parallel processing. And uh, if that, uh, there are certain types of algorithms, it has been shown, I'm not an expert on this, but that you can solve. In particular, you can solve the problem of, uh, uh, of factoring prime numbers. So all of your security, credit card transactions and all that are built, including the button to push the nuclear bomb uh, is, I believe, uh, uh, programmed on uh, knowing factoring these uh, 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 very, very large numbers. So if you can factor them out easily, then you have the answer uh, uh, to push the new bomb, uh, button on the nuclear bomb. Uh, so, so people are worried that uh, somebody will build a quantum computer and solve this problem of security, and, uh, and that's a real uh, issue. Uh, but it can be used for other things, if, if you will, not only for, for, just like anything else in life, uh, good and bad. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you very much.